We've got a wonderful opportunity this evening to be ministered to by three very anointed ladies, and um, I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, Siobhan is going to be first, and then um, Nikki, or Esther, and then Nikki. Please come up. Good evening. How are you guys? I am fantastic because God is amazing. We've got a good father, eh? We definitely do. I always feel blessed being one of God's children because we are loved by an amazing father. You guys ready? Hallelujah. This is going to be good. I just want to share tonight a bit from my heart, what God has been doing in my life, and what He has been sharing in my life with me in the past couple of months is about the spirit of sonship. And we all know about the spirit of sonship. We are part of our Father's home. So if you're part of a home, you know sonship. And just to start off with, if you're a lady here, and you feel slightly awkward about being a son, look at the young man or the man next to you or beside you and just say, you're going to be part of the bride of Christ. So I feel totally comfortable being a son of God, even though I'm his daughter. It's about a, a theme that God is speaking. All right. So in my life, God has been sharing a lot with me about sonship. He's really deepened the journey for me about sonship and I, I'm working through an amazing book and sitting under teaching regarding sonship and the lacks that have been in my life, not reala realizing who I am as a daughter or a son of God. And I know a lot of us have fathers who maybe not, did not affirm you maybe did not know how to love you, maybe did not know how to speak love and affirmation over you. For myself, I grew up without my dad. I did, God was really good, and we did reconcile. And uh, I had the privilege of seeing my dad come to Christ. So I'll see him again one day. Hallelujah. But a lot of us come from broken families. And even though we might have had a mom and a dad that loved us and might not have the capacity to show love to us. And in that area, we might have been left broken. And a lot of my life, I was a broken person. And I think in this path where God is taking me through sonship, it's still a very open and raw space for me. So if you think I've made it, think again. I'm in the process. It's a journey, and, and I'm honoring God for this journey. I'm honoring God that, that he is, his hand is so, so intently upon my life that he will not leave me where I'm at, but he'll take me further. And that's my prayer for you tonight, is that God will take you further. So I'm going to start off just by reading two quotes for you, and then telling you the deduction or the value or the the purpose that I got out of the two quotes, which is life-changing for me in this process where I'm at in becoming more of a son. So the, the first one reads, home is where you constantly hear the voice of God speaking his affirmation over you, his love over you, and his forgiveness, compassion, and grace over you. Powerful. Huh? powerful. Sonship is a heart that feels at rest and secure in God's love. It believes it belongs. It is free from shame and self-condemnation. It walks in honor toward all people and it is willing to humble itself before man and God. That just rocked my world when I read that. I'm like, Lord, help me. I'm not there yet. The value, the principle that I drew from this is sonship is to be at home with the Father. 
And it doesn't mean that we upgrade now and we all go to heaven and we're at home with the Father. It means here to be at home in his presence, to be at home with Father, to be at rest, to be at rest in his presence. I don't know about you guys, but for me, performance was a big thing. Not having my dad around sort of put me into this little package where I thought, well, maybe if I had been a better daughter, maybe if I had done a little bit more, that I could have kept his attention. And the same way I saw my dad, I saw my heavenly father. So when I came to Christ, I thought, oh, well, this, this works really well, so let me do a little bit more quiet time, a little bit more prayer, let me get a little bit more involved, let me do a little bit more, trying to get that affirmation, not necessarily from a heavenly father, but from people and from things that I do, but even though all those things are good principles, quiet time is a principle, it's a lifeline, I look forward to my quiet time every single day, and prayer is a principle, and serving is a principle, What is your motivation? Are you doing it from a position of rest as a son of God? Or are you doing it from a position of, I'm trying to attain favor from my heavenly father? Or from the people around me? So, if I think about this, I think about Luke 15. We all know the story of the prodigal son, right? So here's the first son says, Dad, give me my inheritance. Give it to me. And he goes off and he blows everything. Every last thing. Ends up in the pigsty. Realizes that he, the one thing that he needed was the safety of his father's house. That was the one thing he needed. Thinks to himself he's going to go back as a slave. He wasn't good enough, so he would go back and he'll go work. It was a lot like I thought, like, I've got to do these things right. And when he got home and he said to his father, you know, I want to be a slave, what did his dad do? First of all, his dad went running to him, embraced him, and said, my son, not my slave, my son, you are home. And the oldest son decided to stay there and work. He was there on time every morning. You know people like that, right? They come early. They're like five, ten minutes early, right? Who of you knows someone who comes ten minutes early? Yeah, that was me. I used to be ten minutes early. They come early. They stick to lunchtime. They do their work. They do more than their work. This is the oldest son. Clocks out at the right time and even stays late. And while he was there, working so hard, getting so disgusted, why is my father celebrating this ridiculous young brother of mine that went and squandered everything? He missed the heart of the father. He missed the heart of the father that actually said, you're my son and all of this would be yours anyway. And this is what God wants to say to you guys tonight. You're a son, and all God has is yours anyway. It makes me think of Romans 8. I love Romans 8. If you have any issue with the Father, just read Romans 8. It's so good. It says, For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So even though the oldest brother had this mentality of, I've got to work, I've got to work, it was an orphan mentality. He didn't believe he was a son. But I want to say tonight to you, whether your father was an accurate father or whether he wasn't, it doesn't matter because you're not an orphan, you're a son. You're a daughter because you were created to be a son. You were created to be a daughter. Your spirit was created to cry out, Abba, Father, in layman's terms, Daddy. 
Your spirit was created to reach out to God and say, Daddy. Daddy. When things got tough with you, you should go, Daddy. What do little kids do when they've fallen? Daddy. What does Daddy do? Picks him up. Picks him up, holds him close to his chest. It's okay, it's going to be all right. I realized in Romans 8 verse 19, we all know the scripture. For all creation is eagerly, waiting eagerly with expectation to see the revealing of the sons of God. And when I looked at it, after this journey that God has been taking me on, and I think this is a lifelong journey to discover sonship in every aspect of it. But to understand that first God says in in verse 15 through Paul, that in our spirit we have the capacity to cry, Abba, Father, because we have the spirit of adoption. And then a couple of verses further, he comes and he says that all of creation is is waiting, is eagerly waiting for the sons of God to arise. And we all think, get up in stature. Know, know your position. Know where you belong. Know where home is. Know where you should be at rest. That's where you should be. Kieran, you should be at rest with the Father. That's your place. You're a son. You're a son. I have to say what's amazing about God is that he gives us an amazing godly pattern in the word that if we are stuck without a father on this earth, He gives us the principle of spiritual fathering, of which we have an amazing spiritual father in this house. Not without fault, not perfect by no means. No parent is ever perfect. Ask my son, he'll tell you. And he's so embarrassed now. That's okay, I'm his mother, I can do it. But spiritual fathering can actually usher you into what your earthly father couldn't do. It can usher you into destiny. It can lead you in sonship. It can disciple you into sonship if you submit your life under a spiritual father. I want to just say in short that destiny and inheritance does not stand apart from relationship. Destiny and inheritance is within relationship and within sonship. Will you still inherit God's goodness? Yes, you will. But in order to attain that amazing purpose he has for your life, you need to move into sonship to come into fullness. And God has got fullness for each one of you. Blessing. God has got a destiny for you. An amazing destiny. Every one of you sitting here has got an incredible destiny and I want to bless you that you reach into that destiny. It's God's heart of love, his daddy heart that smiles over you and is calling you to come. Come, my child. He's waiting for you with open arms. And you might not be off the rails at this point. You are seeking him with your whole heart, but you might not experience him as your your Abba, as your daddy. And he's right there. He's right there. Romans 5, 5 says that the Holy Spirit will pour out the love of God into our hearts. So if you don't have that love and you don't feel overwhelmed by the love of God as him for him as a dad for you, then the Holy Spirit is faithful to pour out his love into your heart and make it real. So I'm going to give you guys an example. I shared it this morning as well. Someone who I look up to that I saw through his life really walked into sonship. And um, it's Pastor Conrad, and I know most of you have heard his testimony, how he came from drug addiction, Satanism, radically saved. And we, we prayed for them for ministry, leaving to Georgia now in November. Just a couple of weeks ago on the farm, a lot of you were there. 
And it really touched my heart because that was an amazing, pivotal moment of someone stepping into destiny and inheritance. And I could see it in his life, submitting under a spiritual father and being fathered and becoming a son. And it's such an inspiration to me, such a, uh, an example for myself to say, Lord, take me there. Take me there. I want to be like that. So I'm going to leave a, a final scripture with you guys before I'm going to pray for you. Well, I want to tell you, Father God loves you so much. And this scripture Jesus shared with the disciples about the Father's love for you. And when I read it now, I want you to hear Father God, your daddy, your Abba, saying it to you, saying your name, saying this is how I feel about you. It's in John 16, 27, it says, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and I believe that I came forth from God. But I love how the Amplified says it. It says, for the Father himself tenderly loves you because you've loved me. He tenderly, like a dad, huh? Like a dad. Dads are strong. But when you hurt, who comes with those big, strong arms? A dad in his tenderness. So if you feel tonight like you're not there yet, like me, and you need to step into sonship and, and get that daddy God to just come touch your heart. I want you to reach out in your heart to him now. As we close our eyes, whether you put up your hands and say, Lord, here I am. Flood me with your love. It's between you and God. But I just want to pray that God will come flood you with his love. That you will experience his love. And just experience that fatherly love. That daddy, that Abba coming to wrap his arms around you and saying, son, let's close our eyes. Father, thank you that I can just pray for everyone here. Father, I pray that you will flood them with your presence and with your love. Holy Spirit, come and pour out the love of the Father into their hearts. Abba, come and reveal yourself to them. Give them a revelation of who you are as their, their daddy God, the one they can trust, the one that loves them, the one who tenderly wants to wrap his arms around them. Father, I pray for breakthrough in every area of every person to experience the fullness of your fatherly love. May they step into sonship in the name of Jesus Christ. I bless them with it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I just want to call Nikki to the front. I pray that you'll prepare your hearts as Nikki is going to share with you guys about the peace of God. Good evening. I think um, who we are and we are who we are connected with depends um, well, it, it's all about what's going to flow out of your life. So who you're connected with, the Father, and who you are, who you believe you are in God, his son, his daughter. I've written on my, um, where you enter my house, there's a cupboard, and I've written on there, I am the daughter of the Most High God. Who you are and who you are connected with will depend what flows from your life. So tonight I'm going to speak to you I'm going to ask the question, are you a man of peace? Are you a daughter of um, a woman of peace? Now, there are two types of peace in the world. Inner peace and external peace. All right? Internal is what, how you experience life inside and how you experience yourself inside. And external is relationships um, society, the world, circumstances, nature, um, that is external peace. Now, um, UNESCO, it is the United Nations, um, a division of United Nations, said once, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace 
must be constructed. Internal peace is the core, the essence, the foundation, the guarantee and the maintainer of external peace. If we do not have peace within us, if you do not live from a place of rest, as Siobhan said, or from a place of peace inside, it will have a ripple effect on society, it will have a ripple effect in the nation, it will have a ripple effect in your home, in your family. So it's very important that we work, and we work, discipline ourselves to maintain a heart that is ruled by peace. Now, I want to ask a question. Who is at work in you? Who is at work in you? There are two authorities that can be at work in us. The first one is the Prince of Peace. A prince is a ruler. A prince is one who has authority. He can be at work in us. The second authority is the accuser. He can be at work. The thief that comes to steal, uh, kill, and destroy. The destroyer, the liar, the worker of chaos can be at work in you. And you can live from that authority. So there's always turmoil inside, turmoil in your thoughts, turmoil in your emotions. And that is what rules rule your life. What authority is at work in you? Whose authority is anchored in you? Psalm 30, 34 verse 15 says, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. If I, um, say for instance, Ruth came and she said to me, Nikki, I brought you a chocolate and I've, I've hidden it away for you, but it's somewhere here on stage. I must go and look for it. You know, I will come and I will look for it because I know there's something special. <laughs> I know that chocolate exists. And I will seek for it until I find it. You will only seek something if you know that it exists. The scripture says, seek peace and pursue it. Do you know that there is peace for your soul? Do you know that, there, that peace is your portion for life? More than anxiety, more than fear, more than rejection, it is your portion. Seek it until you find it. And pursue it. Pursue means it's not behind you. You pursue something that is in front. You need to go to it. All right? So you need to stretch out. You need to pursue it. You need to go for it. Not just on the way and looking back. You pursue it with all your might until you find it. And, you, and it becomes your purpose in life. All right? The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It means wholeness, wellness, well-being, safe, happy, friendly, favor. Just think of peace. And this is everything what peace is. Favor, completeness, to make peace, a peace offering, secure, to prosper, to be victorious, to be content, tranquil, quiet, and restful. It also means to restore, to make something whole and complete. If you need to restore something, it means it was broken, all right, or it's in a state that it can't work, or it's not in its best state. That is when something, when you restore something. Now, peace comes, and it restores us. 
It restores something. If you were anxious, you need to come to the place of peace. You need to allow peace to rule in your mind and in your emotions, in your heart. It restores you. It strengthens you. All right? Um, um, to make something whole and complete, I want to say, without peace, it's like having a disability. It means that you are not complete in that sense. Something is lacking. If I don't have my right arm, I only have my left arm. If I want to write now with a pen, I need to put down this, this mic. All right? There's a disability. There's a lack of function in that sense. All right? So peace means to complete. Completely complete. That is what God wants to come and do in us. Now, um, with the Hebrew language, we have the alphabet letters like we have in, in Afrikaans and English. And, but then next to that alphabet, there's a, pic, a pictographic um, uh, symbols that they also have for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if you write out the word shalom, um, there's a picture for every letter. And if you put those pictures next to one another... The meaning of shalom is to destroy the authority that binds to chaos. Shalom, peace, destroys the authority that binds to chaos. Shalom is a declaration that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will destroy the one who is responsible for chaos and confusion. What authority is at work in you? Because if the thief, the liar, the destructor, the worker of chaos is at work in you with his authority of destruction, peace has the ability to destroy that authority that binds you to the rejection, the anxiety. Because I've realized through lockdown, this is what God uh, started to teach me during lockdown, is to bring my heart to peace to allow the Prince of Peace to rule. Because so often we allow anxiousness to just have its, have its way in us, in your, in your thoughts, in your emotions, and it brings you into a state of being. And, you, and constantly I felt something is wrong, something is wrong, and the Holy Spirit showed me that I am not allowing His peace in these areas. I am not at rest inside. And he said, allow my peace to come. So what the devil comes and do, the destroyer, he creates such chaos inside with the negative emotions, the negative thoughts that we experience. It's chaos. We don't allow Jesus to rule. You know, it's actually hard work. <laughs> it's hard work to get to peace. It's not, it's not easy. You have to practice yourself to come to peace. Now, um, um, I'm going to come, come back to that. and Let me say it. And during lockdown, God, at a stage, he said to me, Nikki, um, have a quiet spirit. Um, be still and be quiet and be at rest. And he said to me, put off your music. Put off the television. Put off the movies. Don't listen to audiobooks. Don't watch sermons on YouTube. Put it all off. Sit. And he, he said to me, sit in the chair and be still. Yo. In the beginning, that was difficult. I thought, all right, here I sit. Now what? <laughs> but I sat. And um, God started to change me because stillness, quietness, being at rest and in peace has a power to change us. That's why Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He rules with peace. It's not a force that comes against you. He rules with peace. It's very contradicting. 
How can you rule with peace? But you can. So God said, sit in this chair. And now I make it a habit in my life not to easily just put on the music because we love to put on music. Hey? I don't know if you are like me. Sometimes I jive there in my kitchen while I make food, watch the dishes. All right? But um, so we are so e- it's so easy for us to put on music. But I want to challenge you to go and sit in a chair somewhere, make time, be quiet. Don't pray. Don't read Bible. Be quiet. God has started to change my life, my behavior towards life. Where I can put life there and look at it and choose how will I experience it and how will I respond to it. Just by practicing to keep my heart at peace to guard my peace within. It's your portion. Why do we give it away so easily? If something happens, there goes your peace. You know what? Peace is not a feeling. It is a person. Why do do we give away the person of peace? So easily. He's the prince. We treat him like the prince of your heart. Shalom destroys the authority that binds us to chaos. He will quiet you with his love. Have a quiet spirit. Be at peace and rest. Zephaniah 3.17 says, Uh, That specific part says, he will rest in silent satisfaction, and in his love, he will be silent and make no mention of past sins or even recall them. This scripture just grabbed my heart, and I realized, you know what? It says here, he will rest, and in his love, he will be silent. Do you know that God's love silenced him? Why? Why? When he looks at us, and, you know, the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sins. The blood of Jesus covers our sins, and that love of God caused him to keep silent. That's why the word says, he removes our sin as so far away from us, he doesn't think about it anymore. His love caused him to be silent. His love is greater. So, his love silence him. Who am I to not allow love to quiet me? If God does it to himself, his love quiets him in his judgment towards me. Who am I to judge myself? Who am I to allow all these negative things Worries, fears, failures, inabilities to come and rule and steal the love in my heart. One John four verse four says, "You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. The one that is in us." is greater than the one that is in the world, who rules in the world, who has free will, uh, free, free rule, the devil. He comes with his chaos, he works, his destruction. He's in the world, the one that is against Christ. But God says, he that is in you is greater. And today we speak about the Prince of Peace, who's living in our hearts. He is greater. The peace, the portion of peace that God has for us is greater inside than that which rules in the world. All right? At a stage, God uh, really, uh, he he caused such a tenacity in me um, against 
the negativity that, we some, that I sometimes experience, the anxiousness, the fears, the worries, the, the emotions and the thoughts that is creating chaos within. And at a stage, I just said, no more. Because I want to live in this portion of peace that is mine. I don't want to give it away. And God just started to let me rise up. But I believe it's how I started to submit to the Prince of Peace. You have to submit to him. You need to submit to his rulership, to the truth of him being peace. And that caused this authority to rise in me to say no more. So when the thoughts come, and I became severely, how can I say that? Disciplined in myself, with myself. When a thought comes, when anxiousness comes, or whatever, finances, whatever, I just stop it right there. Say, stop it. No more. Shalom. I invite it. Shalom. You know, shalom is a greeting. Shalom. We bless one another. We can bless one another with shalom. When you sit in a meeting and there's conflict, or they sit in a relationship and you have this conflict situation, what must rule in your heart? Shalom. You bless that person with shalom. You cannot... You may not even speak a word, but the blessing will flow from your heart because it's ruling there. You need to get your will in action against the chaos that wants to rule. If your will is not in action against the accuser, the liar, the destructor, you will not have victory. You, your will must come in action. God took me on this path where I had to literally rein myself in with practical strategies how to do that. That's how the victory came. I want to lastly speak to you about Gideon. Gideon had an encounter with, uh, with God who said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. In Judges 6, verse 24 and 25, it says, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and, and called it the Lord is peace. Why? Because God spoke peace to him. Peace to you. He got a revelation. Um, and verse 25, it says, God said to him, And pull down the altar of Baal and cut down the uh, um, Asherah, the goddess. So God... Uh, said to, to him to come and, and break down the altars and pull down the, the idols. You know what Gideon's name means? It means feller or warrior. A feller is somebody who a fell a tree. You know, you cut down trees. And here Gideon, God instructed Gideon. That's why God said to him, you mighty, what did he say? You, you mighty valor, valor, what, what, what? Mighty man of valor. There you go. Why? Because his name is Feller. Warrior. You know, God, God wants us to destroy the altars and the idols that wants to come and rule in our hearts. Because what is an altar? It's a connection. What connections do you have in your heart with the authority of the destroyer, the liar, the thief, the accuser. You have to destroy that altar in your heart and in your mind and in your emotion, that connection. You have to stop it. You have to come against it. You have to fell it. You have to set up a memorial, an altar, a beacon, a fortification of shalom, in your heart, and in your mind. Strip past experiences of its authority. Connect with the person of peace. I want you to close your eyes, please. What altars do you have in your emotions and in your thoughts what connections do you have in your thought life, in your emotions? 
that God wants to come and say, destroy it, pull it down, cut it down. Because you allow the authority of the destructor, the accuser, the destroyer, the liar, the worker of chaos to rule in you. Just bring those things before God. Lord, I thank you that you want to encourage us tonight like, you've, uh, like when you encouraged Gideon, you mighty man of valor. You can pull it down. You can cut it down. I thank you, Lord, that with you in our lives, we are capable of the impossible. And tonight we invite you, Prince of Peace, come. Come and take up your rulership in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions. Lord, we do not want to have the worker of chaos ruling in our hearts. We want you to rule with your peace. We are your habitation. We are your temple. Come and rule with peace. Lord, may your peace minister to us. May it transform our emotions, our will, our thoughts, our identity and personality. Come and transform. Come and renew. Come and restore. May quietness, gentleness, patience, freedom, and peace, let it come and saturate our behavior, Lord. In good and bad circumstances, may we not be influenced by what is going on around us. May we not be influenced by life and experiences. But I pray that we will guard the portion of peace that you have died for us for. That we will guard it with our lives. Lord, I thank you that you've made with us a covenant of peace and completeness. And thank you that we stand in this covenant with you. And therefore, we break down any, any other altar that comes against this covenant of peace and completeness that we have with you. In Jesus' name. Lord, may your peace and your rest cause us to take hold of the freedom of being and living in your fullness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Go home and go and take five minutes. Put everything off. It's possible. No matter what our lifestyles are, who you are, how many children you have, it is possible. Go and sit somewhere. I've, sorry, I just want to say that I li uh, when I visited Switzerland to do minister there, uh, twice I lived at this family. And you know, their priority of giving God time to God was so high that they created this room in their house. A room where you can connect with God and you can close the door. And if you are in there, nobody may come and disturb you. That's how high a priority they had of spending time with God. Everybody knew. And the lady taught her son. He was primary school. He knew that if his mother is in that room, he may not come and disturb her. And he started to respect time with God. And he knew he cannot throw a tantrum. And um, it blessed me so much because I could see the priority they've made to sit with God. So I want to challenge you. Find five minutes you will see maybe in the beginning it will be difficult because we are such an, in such a habit of just being busy, being entertained. And it's difficult to, to shut down your mind. But I want to challenge you, go and do it. And say, Lord, I invite you. Come and let peace rule. I just want to share the scripture. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know I am God. That word be still 
means let it be, let be. And it also means to cure and to heal. When we come in quietness before God and allow God, allow ourselves to become quiet and still and meditate on God, He cures us. He heals us. And that's what I've seen in my life, this lockdown, what God started to do. Amazing. So I want to bless you with that. May you find that time to just sit with God. Thanks, Esther. Amen. 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 Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, his mother, apparently there were lots of kids as well, as in tens up. Uh, she apparently used a blanket. She put a blanket over her head because they didn't have space to be alone. And um, so the kids knew if the blanket's over her head, she's speaking to God. Leave mom alone. So for those who live in crowded spaces, just a blanket. You know, um, not just the mask. I mean, so if we know, to take from what Siobhan said, if we know who we are, sons of God, and if we work, uh, allow the Prince of Peace to be at work in us, we can build, dwell, and increase. That picture is a picture from the movie, animated movie, The Joseph Prince, King of Dreams. And um, this is the part where he was in jail. So he's thrown in jail, like all the, you know, everything just goes bad with him from when the brothers sell him, right? And then, um, and then it goes good because he works for Potiphar and then his wife. <sighs> and then jail, okay? So he gets to jail. Now, um, I wanted to play the video clip, but I've got 10 minutes and the video clip's three. So the video clip shows where he's, um, where there's this little piece of, uh, dried out tree with one green leaf on. And then how he takes that little piece and he starts, you know, giving a little bit of water. When he gets some water, he gives it some of his own water. He has a little bit of water. He gives it some water. Um, and he just starts, he starts building in this prison. For what? He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to grow a tree. It's not like there were definitely no fruit on it, looked like it. Um, now, obviously, whether this actually happened, okay, <laughs> we don't know. But, but this, uh, we'll get back to Joseph now, but he, he started building and increasing where he was, even though he was in jail, and there was no even hope for that matter of, or reason for him to do that. Okay, so then Jeremiah 29, please go there in your Bibles, um, digital or paper. I just always do this. If you've got a paper Bible and you're ready there, just like let your pages do this for the person who's preaching. It helps them to know you are going there. It really does. Okay, just me. <laughs> so Jeremiah 29, um, we all know verse 11. We'll get there just now. This is where um, the Israelites was taken into captivity in Babylon. All right, so read with me verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. I have caused. God caused them to go into captivity. Now, I want to segue in here and just explain this. Many Christians take things like this or Job, story of Job and things, and say bad things happen to you because God wants to use you to do this or God wants to teach you something. Now, I want to firstly say no. God will not let you be raped so he can teach you something. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? So, so please make sure you hear correctly from God before you try comfort someone, all right, with like, mm, okay, there's two sides, I would say more than two sides to this coin, but let's just say two sides. Um, just go to the next one. Yes, there's discipline and there's gravity. Okay, so discipline is when my child um, does something that I told them not to do, they get disciplined, whichever way is legal nowadays. And then, um, then there's this other side where he climbs on a, uh, what do you call this? Klimram. Jung jungle gym, that's it. He climbs on a jungle gym and he falls off like this and he breaks an arm, which actually happened. Okay, and that's called gravity. It's not God let him fall off to teach him what exactly. Okay, do, do, you, do you understand? 
discipline and gravity, under, understand which side of the coin you're at in that moment. Life happens. Like lightning bolts happen. And if you happen to be in the way of a lightning bolt, you will go straight and be in heaven. Hopefully. If you're not so sure about this, please come speak to us afterwards. Yes. All right. And then um, I want to show you quickly the pictures. Yeah, it's coming. So Romans, pause, go back. Okay. Romans 8, 28 says, God makes everything work for the good for those who love him, right? So that's a lightning bolt when it hits sand, by the way. It makes this really cool thing. And then it's actually glass. It turns sand into glass. So just show the next picture. It, that's glass sculptures from lightning that hits sand, which is really, really cool. Um, and then the next picture is if the sand had volcanic ash in it. There we go. If the sand had volcanic ash in it, it gives you this really cool green glass thing. It's cool, eh? All right, so God makes everything work for the good. If gravity, if a lightning bolt happens, he makes it work for the good. Something beautiful can come out of it. He doesn't go, boom, I want to hit you with a lightning bolt. Lightning's going to happen. We live on earth. Okay, gravity happens. This is how it happens. Bad things sometimes happen just because we hear. Okay, but then God takes it and he's going to turn it for his good. So, he disciplined. Sorry, say amen. Amen. So, God's going to turn the lightning bolt in a beautiful glass sculpture. And if anyone feels that they're slightly a bit more in the volcanic side, there's a volcano, the heat is on as well, not just the lightning bolt, you'll get out way nicer as well. Okay. Okay. God turns it for his good. Then let's read um, verse 11, of which we all know, but let's read it. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call... No, stop. Stop there. Okay. So he will give you a future and a hope. We always quote this saying, don't worry, God's got an awesome plan for your life. Yay. And then we think, Instant. Okay. Instant two-minute noodles. Those who live on it, just, just wave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the honest. Two-minute noodles. Thanks. Just really? Re nobody else on two-minute noodles. Thanks. Thanks. What? More vite. Ah. Okay. More vite people? Can I see the more vite people? Okay. Wow. I thought that's gone extinct. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so verse 10, so let's just skip one back here. Verse 10 says, thus says the Lord, after 70 years are, are completed at Babylon, captivity, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So 70 years, God's going to give them discipline for 70 years. That is, we figured out this morning, Tony Trey was here, that was four generations. She's just over, she's almost 80. She's 80. She's over 80, huh? All right. She's so four generations um, in her family already that's existing. So sometimes what you do now will have an impact for a fourth, fifth generation, your fourth or fifth generation. And that is a very difficult thing, I think, for us to grasp because many times we live for ourselves and society has taught us to live for ourselves. Me, my life, the things I want to achieve, achieve in life but we don't think beyond that. If I say five rand a month now, oh, it's nothing. I'm not going to have anything at the end of the year for holiday. Mm, but maybe f five generations down the line we'll have something to work with. Have you ever thought of saving five rand a month for five generations in the future? Who does that? But don't you think five generations or five generations back, if they did something like that, okay, let's say one rand back then, or 50 cents, that would have been awesome, right, for you to be able to work with that, that they saved for you. So just think sometimes a bit beyond your life here. It's, life is a bit bigger than just you. Everyone say life is a bit bigger than me. Okay, that's going to be tough. Okay, so 70 years. Now here, just show us the next thing. We've got this hope in verse 11, but many times, Next one. We have a microwave hope instead of a marinade hope. Everyone look at someone next to you and say microwave. Say quick and easy. Say marinade. Long. But nice. 
good. So um, if anyone's ever forgotten to take the meat out before a braai, you know what happens? You have to quickly pop it in the microwave. And is that nice? No. I mean, maybe. No. No, it's not. If you marinate it a day, a two, how many is legally fine to eat? Nikki, how many days? Okay. What's the longest the something can marinate? Days. Days. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. In the fridge. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. All right. So, days. Or 70 years, all right, according to the Israelites. So sometimes we have to understand we, we have a marinade hope in God. That scripture is about marinating in God and allowing that time of marinating. Say, so I will be marinated. And go, tss, tss. Okay, okay. Let's go to verse 5. It's verse 5. It says, so what happens while we're marinating? Verse 5. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, one generation further, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, another generation, so that they may be sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. Pause quickly, verse 7. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. Now, I, I want to bring that to what Nikki said is understand that where you're at might not be great. The friendships you have, the family maybe, the workplace where you're at, where you're studying might not be nice sometimes. But if you, you work towards peace for that place because you will have peace. You pray for God for that place. doesn't matter whether you love them or not, like them or not, you will love them, you will forget and forgive, and <laughs> peace will come. Everyone say, peace will come. All right. So, going back to verse 5 and 6, build. You can just um, throw all of them. Build, dwell, plant. Take and increase. Now, here's the deal is, these things talk about long-term activities. It looks beyond the immediate challenges. Now, I don't want to speak doom and gloom, but the economists and fancy people are saying apparently COVID, the effects of COVID, um, will truly only be seen in, in 18 months. So, and apparently many more businesses will close down in 18 months. I'm not speaking this out in Jesus' name. Just, okay, I'm just saying that's what the facts are, all right? And, and we have to understand is what we see around us might think, you might think, what's the point? Why? What's the point? If you look at where you're at right now, will you be doing, let me say this, if you could do anything in the world, anything, just think about it, if it's not what you are doing right now, you are diminishing yourself. Okay, so just, I'm, I'm not saying like, hey, I want to go skydive, I'm not saying that. Um, <laughs> all right, that's a one sort of thing. But, but if, if there's anything you can achieve or do for God, let's say that, if there's anything you can do for God, anything, anything, you can just dream of anything you would love to do for God. If you're not doing it right now, why not? We are being diminished. And that's the, the best part for me of the scripture, verse 6. It says um, that you may be increased and not diminished. It's like God just wanted to make sure we understand, don't, don't step back, step forward and more forward, and go, and keep going, and if you feel like, I can't give those many steps, but I can only give this little, then you give this little. Joseph had little water, I'm sure that maybe they gave him water, I don't know, maybe it rained, and he caught some, I don't know what their jails are like, but he had little, and he gave a little away. He had obviously some, I'm sure he didn't, you know, he didn't, <laughs> okay, die of, um, thirst, but um, so he gave some away, even though he had little, and many times we think we don't have enough time, we don't have, uh, we're giving and giving and giving in our friendships, but we don't get enough back, we, we um, work so hard, but we don't achieve anything that we're thinking we want to achieve, we're saving up everything and holding our money together just so that we have enough, but it's never enough, and then the moment you start living from a place of peace, from living from a place of sonship, knowing who is your provider and in whose kingdom you are living, you will be able to start living there 
in generosity. I pray a spirit of generosity over each one of us here tonight. We will not hold on to the things that we think we have so little of, and maybe we factually have little of it. But in God's kingdom, we have way too many of it, (laughs) too much of it. We have. We need to start living there and not living here in our immediate circumstances. I would like you to stand up and pray with, with me. I'm going to facilitate prayer, and um, I just, I'm just going to say a few actions that I'd like you to follow in, okay? Now, the actions are, um, even in worship, many times we say, God, um, here I am, and then you can say, here I am, but sometimes just opening up your hands is, is, is kind of reinforcing that surrender that's happening in your heart. It's not a magic trick, just, okay? I want to also just challenge you on the end, on this, is many times when, when people pray at the end of, a, of something and God spoke to you, just open up your hands and say, yes, God, I receive this. It's sometimes this physical je- gesture just reinforces what's happening in my spirit. Okay. All right. So I want you to close your eyes and just open up your hands in front of you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and show each one of us that place of captivity, that place of um, of desert that we might be in, a place where we, we, feel, we might feel a lack in finances, in, in, in friendships, in emotion. We might feel depressed and down. We might, um, we might feel in captivity or in, enslaved in our workplace. God, show us that place, that place right now in our hearts, in our lives. Now, can I, can I ask you to just close your fists, your hands into fists tight, squeeze as if you're holding something that w- must not leave your hands. And God, I just pray that, that this that we are holding tightly onto, that we don't want to let go, we just want to keep it together, the control that we, we, we're trying to, to hold onto, we come and release it. And if you feel that release, I pray that you open up your hands and release that. God, we release the control of our finances. We release control over relationships. We release control over our emotions. We release control over our um, workplace, our circumstances where we're at in our families. We release that control into your hands We trust you. We come and choose to trust you. Even if we don't understand you, God, we trust you fully now. I'd like you to put one hand on your heart, one hand on your heart and one hand up, as if you're saying, God, here I am. Here I am. God, we just come as sons. We come and stand in this place as sons We're not going to strive anymore to try and work hard, to try and achieve things, God. But we we will stand as sons in this place of peace, knowing who you are. We stand and we will go and we will build. We will plant. We will eat. We will make things grow around us, God. If it's the smallest of things, we will grow. We will be generous with, with what you've given us. How much or how little we have, we will be generous with it in Jesus' name. Here we are. Send us. Here we are. We will increase your kingdom in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen.